Um, I'm, I'm excited to be able to share with you. So, yeah, um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to share this. This is uh, a deed of privilege. Uh, so I invite you on a journey with me now from discouragement to hope. So as we, we begin, let me ask you a few questions to just for a personal reflection. On a scale of 1 to 10, um, let me do that first. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your discouragement level? Just um, think about it in your mind. Second question, do you ever feel numb from the constant barrage of media telling us more bad news about the developments of COVID? Third one, do you ever find yourself wishing that you could just go back to the way things were before? Or is the thought of ever quitting ever entering your mind? I guess it's fair um, um, that most, if not all of us, have struggled throughout this pandemic, and I'm sure the degrees and circumstances vary, but I'm, um, I'm not aware of anyone in Christian Camping who has not struggled some way since uh, March 2020. Now, if you look at this little uh, description that I, I took a screenshot today, I've been following this for a while, it's interesting to look at, at um, where each of our countries falls on the scale of being impacted by COVID. Um, just some general observations that every country has been impacted. That's why it's called a pandemic. Most countries were thinking that the pandemic was coming to a close until the variants started appearing. We all have experienced the variants. Uh, the best news is that the trend in each country seems to be on the way down. That's really good news. And um, I now would like to give you some observations of what I think. Um, is going on uh, in Christian camps and in with leaders themselves. First, it seems that many leaders are giving up and quitting more than ever before. 16% of leaders say that they've had to quit a job due to stress. A new poll from Monster.com, that's the job-finding website, found that 95% of workers are thinking about finding a new job. Now, that's a lot of people. Uh, not necessarily they're going to follow through, but the thought is entered their mind. And the top culprit was uh, was burnout. So many leaders are giving up. Uh, the Financial Post, a Canadian magazine, reported this year that 51% of senior managers are considering leaving, retiring, downshifting, or to a less demanding and stressful job. Uh, burnout was the big culprit, and they reported that uh, 82% reported that they, they uh, finished work feeling mentally or physically exhausted. Maybe you can relate. They're unable to relax when they get home and are having difficulty sleeping. 55% said perceived that they will be stigmatized if their workplace found out that they struggle with some kind of mental health issue. I don't have the Christian camping statistics on these specific things, but um, I've heard many fellow directors speak in similar ways throughout this pandemic. So, what's contributing to this? Uh, the second observation I'd like to make is that um, leaders are, are discouraged. Talk to most camp directors and they'll say that they're worn out from constantly having to pivot, and frankly, it's discouraging. I can imagine that some of us here today are also discouraged. The third observation I'd like to make is that many people are lonely. And it's interesting, loneliness was on the rise before um, the pandemic, and in 2018, the UK even hired its first minister for loneliness. I'm not sure how much that's really well known, but that's crazy that a minister for loneliness, but it's, it's certainly an, uh, an epidemic in not only the UK, but around the world. In 2021, people in 29 countries were surveyed about loneliness, and uh, those who answered, I have felt lonely often, well, 50% came from Brazil, that answered. 34% from the UK and Canada had 31, and the US had 31. Didn't have all the, all the other countries because it was only 29, but interesting to see how loneliness certainly is there. Medical research has shown that loneliness impacts your health in the same way as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being obese. That's before the pandemic in 2018, just as a reminder. People are using the term epidemic of loneliness. Susan Mates uh, in our Metis, I'm sure you pronounce her name, and the Barna Group will release a book uh, in November um, by that same title, The Epidemic of Loneliness. Many people are generally lonely, and it makes sense that leaders would also be lonely. Um, leaders are not exempt, and perhaps it's even worse, because as the saying goes, it is lonely often at the top. 
So Allison Gabriel and others from the University of Florida researched negative impacts of loneliness in leaders. And uh, here's an observation that she made. When leaders felt lonely, their followers rated them less effective in their leader role and less empowering. Well, it makes sense, I guess. Here are some, re some reasons that uh, Kerry Newhoff listed in his leadership blog about why people, people feel lonely. <laughs> Maybe you can relate to these. I certainly can. The problems that you have to solve and I have to solve are not solvable by most people. Uh, number two is that we spend all of our energy at work and we get home. There's not left, much left to give. Or you're never really on and you're really never off in this pandemic. And I can think, like I said, most leaders can relate to that. Ellen does make a few observations about how COVID has impacted the Christian camping world. We know that all of them have been impacted as we've already seen. Generally, it seems that most are hanging in there. Larger camps with more fixed costs seem to have been hit harder than smaller camps. Now, some smaller camps have been able to close down with virtually minimal impact because uh, they don't count on that uh, needed uh, cost income to come through the year. I've heard many rumors of some camps recurring a greater uh, uh, debt load to survive. And overall, it seems that very few camps have closed over the past few, uh, few years. Uh, and those who have closed were already on life support prior to COVID. Uh, COVID was just accelerating, accelerating the demise. Uh, this seems to be seen in lots of countries. Uh, this is good news because uh, Greg Hunter was, was telling me um, just recently that the, the U.S. consultant, a U.S. consultant uh, for Christian camps was predicting that 57% of camps would close their doors in COVID. Well, fortunately, that has not been the case. Uh, and I don't think that's the case around the world from other camp camps that I've talked to. Christian camping has been extremely creative. <laughs> and just, you expect nothing but this from Christian camp. Um, and to be able to minister and keep their organizations afloat. Most CCI associations have well attended virtual conferences, with uh, some recruiting actually record numbers. Many camps have been using virtual options, as we've been talking about even in the last session, and uh, especially in 2020, not as much as we've been, uh, I think, trying to get back into the swing of things. At the extreme ends, it's interesting that some camps have been able to stay open the entire pandemic. I don't know, they've had to adjust, most camps have to adjust a little bit. But some have actually been closed the entire pandemic and are still closed today. So due to COVID, COVID restrictions, uh, most camps have been significantly underutilized compared to their potential capacity. We, we know that. And we can take a lot more people than we are. You know, that certainly isn't economically a good news uh, long term, and it's also not ministry good news as well. I've heard many stories of camps and conference centers whose generous donations have stepped up. This has been amazing. Some camps have actually reported that their financial position has improved over this time, which is interesting. Mediva, is where I work in Ontario, used the metaphor throughout this, um, this entire time. We estimated that we would need about $600,000 to go across a COVID bridge to bring us to the other side. Um, we're just coming to the end of that now and... <laughs> Amazingly enough, we have seen that almost being met. We're just a little short of that right now. Like many camps, we pivoted from our usual overnight and day camp programs and only basically ran day camp programs, some LIT programs because they lasted for four weeks, and family rentals of cabins this past summer. Um, the government was just too late for us to open the doors. Um, to me, the recovery from this pandemic is different than the recovery from the 2008 economic crisis where most uh, of the economy was impacted. During the pandemic, while some industries were very much hurting, uh, have you noticed that others are thriving? Example, think of the in-person restaurant or hospitality business and how much they've been suffering. Compare that with the tech companies or a delivery company like Amazon that's making record profits and shooting people into outer space. Another observation I'd like to make is that the growing division between the rich and the poor. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is disappearing. Certainly the poor have suffered the most into this pandemic. Another observation is that, about Christian camping is that many are finding it more challenging to get qualified leaders to run their ministries. 
a BBC poll, obviously that's not Canada or, or North, North America, but a uh, BBC poll uh, had 94% of the retailers said that they're having a hard time finding enough staff. My informal poll of Christian camps says that many camps are also finding this more difficult, especially those camps that didn't run in 2020, and their recruitment chain has been disrupted. I can only imagine what's happened to those camps who haven't run for two years and how they're going to get back into the swing of things when the campers that they've been recruited who have become staff members, who, uh, the chain has been broken. So this has been a season of many losses. In CCI negotiations, we've lost in-person gatherings, loss of revenue streams. Our member camps and conferences, loss of ministry opportunities and revenue streams as well. And personally, people have struggled with physical and mental health challenges. Distances between friends and family have made it incredibly difficult. In 1969, a psychiatrist, Elizabeth Kluber Ross, proposed a theory that there were five stages of personal grief. And I, I, was, uh, I came across, I've uh, heard those stages for years, but I came across uh, another article by David Kessler, who's uh, was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review in response to the pandemic, he applied those stages in the following ways. The first stage is stage of denial, which you saw a lot in early. I mean, this virus won't affect us. The second stage is, you're making me stay home by taking away my activities. It's anger. Third stage is bargaining. Okay, if I stay home for two weeks, everything will be better, right? I can remember watching someone saying to me, you know, this pandemic could go on for like a couple of years. I, I, I couldn't even cross that when I first heard it. And then there's sadness. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be. Like, when will it? Are we gonna, is this going to stay with us for a long time? And finally, there's acceptance. If, if this is happening, I've got to figure a way out and how we're going to proceed. While some doubt the validity of the stages of grief, and you can read that on the internet if you like, but what remains undisputed is that grief and mourning is a necessary part of responding in a healthy way to loss. Terry Wardle in a, is a professor at Ashland University, our seminary, and he was recently interviewed on the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And here are some quotes that jumped out to me. In leadership, who gets time to grieve a loss? You experience a loss, off you go. I mean, that's, maybe that can, you can relate to that. Loss is meant to be grieved. And when we fail to grieve losses, that loss internalizes. Grieving loss begins with finding a safe environment with people that are non-condemning, empathic, who are confidential, and who finally give you the permission to say what's inside and say it as it is. And uh, I don't know where you're at. I'm not sure if you've been able to grieve losses, but I believe that we need to do that as Christians and as Christian camping professionals. So long before secular theories of grieving, the Bible tells us about the importance of lament. Clearly, one third of the Psalms fall under this genre of lament. And I've been spending a lot of time in the Psalms lately, and I'm convinced that we need to understand that they are also a model for us today. We like singing the praise songs, but we don't often sing in our church services lament songs. So here's a great, a great quote from, uh, about laments uh, from the Hebrew scholar Mark Chapter. Oops, let me go back. Press the wrong button. The laments are for times that the proverbial rug is pulled out from under our feet. <laughs> Does this not feel like COVID, by the way? <laughs> As I'm reading, the proverbial rug pulled out under our feet. These are, these are uh, our songs, not for when life is well-ordered, but when life has become chaotic. These have been called songs of disorientation. When life is topsy-turvy, when life is turned upside down, these are those agonizing cries. Where, O oh Lord? Like, how long, O oh Lord? Why, O oh Lord? One of my favorite lament psalms is Psalm 42 and 43. And, and I say it's a lament psalm, even though I said two, that was done on purpose. Because really these psalms probably were originally one psalm. And you can see when you read the psalms that that's the case. I don't have time to study it now, but I'd like to read it once. And I'm going to read it once, just annotating a title, telling it about some specific parts of it. So verses 1 through 5 of, five of chapter 42 talks about the, uh, the 
the psalmist longing for God. He says, As the deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, but for the living God. Where shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food night and day. Uh, well, they say to me all day long, where is your God? Remember, the things I remember I, as a part of my soul, how would I go into the throng and lead them to the procession of the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet again praise him, my salvation and my God. That stanza there is going to be repeated three times. So he longs for God, and then he, then he goes into this next section, and he's, he's overwhelmed by the circumstances, just like we've been overwhelmed by the circumstances that have surrounded us. My soul is cast down within me, he says. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Mizra. He calls the deep and the roar of your waterfalls and the breakers of your waves have gone over me. Uh, by day the Lord commanded his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer uh, to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go in the morning because of my oppression of my enemies? And with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. And while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Then he goes into the next chapter, which is all, again, I think part of the same song. And he talks about vindication from his enemies or circumstances. So vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against the ungodly people. And from the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? And why do I go about mourning because of the impression of my enemy? Send out the light of your truth and, and let them lead me. Let them bring me into your holy hill and your dwelling. And then verse 4 it talks about his resolve to praise. And he says, Then I will go to the altar of my God and to God my exceeding joy and I will praise you with the liar. O oh God, my God. And ending the psalm with the same thing we've now read twice, this is the third time. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet again praise him, my salvation and my God. Have you taken time to grieve your losses since COVID started? What I'd like to do is a little bit, a little bit scary, but I'd like you to just open the chat and just jot any kind of loss that you've experienced, either like as an organization or, and you can be really specific and just throw them in the chat. Let's kind of see what, what comes up when we, when we talk about the losses that we've received. Personal connection, you have people, ministry opportunities, absolutely, togetherness. Socializing. I mean, we could probably be specific about the people. Ah, fellowship with Christians, yeah? Hugs and bonfires, yes. Loss of unity, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's just way too much division now, isn't there? So much controversy. Ah, the CCI conferences, absolutely. We need to be with people. Resources. Many of us have suffered from that. Many people have left church. Yeah, I don't know whether they're coming back. Small groups stop meeting for a while. And so we could go on and on. And I would encourage you actually to take time to reflect and, and think about ways in which you've experienced losses and, and express those just like the psalmist did in his song. I'd like to ask your permission for me to be somewhat vulnerable with you today. Uh, can I do that? Can I? Can I oh, are you okay with that? Um, it's a little bit risky on my part, but I'd, I'd like to share with you what I've been through and experiencing the last several months. So I've always tried to be a positive person, and especially when it comes to leading. 
And in the course of the pandemic, I found myself constantly worn out by all the news, exhausted from constantly having to pivot. And, uh, and by doing and, and continually like creating seemingly endless contingency plans. How many contingency plans have you created? Now in a stage of life, in addition to what's happening in the pandemic, I've reached a stage in my life where I'm not leading an organization directly. First time actually since I'm 18 years of age. <laughs> new, new experience for me. Well, I was always leading something. And even as I uh, initiated many of these changes, including transitioning from the executive director position in, uh, a few years ago, I have no doubt that it was a good thing to do, but actually I kind of struggled. It's not been easy to make that adjustment. Health-wise, in addition, uh, I've had several nagging issues. I, why did they come up at the same time? I, I, I've had these several, like I can, you don't want to hear them all. I, I could talk to you about, about like seven or eight different little things that have come up. And, and many of them actually have caused me not to be the things that I find life giving. And as a result, I, I was struggling with negative message. Like it's getting worse. It's not getting better. And I found myself often confirming those neural pathways in my mind by saying them over and over again. So quite frankly, I was I felt stuck, discouraged, and I started uh, I, I just felt a sense that I was giving up. And I began to realize that I was struggling with mental health. So over the past uh, few decades, I've done an annual wilderness solo, and some of you know that it's something that's been part of my life for a while now. And this year's wilderness solo was in July, where I took a canoe out for four days and. And just uh, got along with God and did some thinking and preparing. And uh, during my soul, I moved and made, made a strategic change as God touched me in my heart, as I was able to refocus. I moved from this passivity and helplessness to instead engagement in war. Those aren't words that I say normally. And so in my struggle to regain my mental health, I had adapted a single word focus for this year. And that word to me is fight. In each of my commitments, I've had my, they start with the word fight. Things that I need to fight for that I know are right in my life. Just like David, he, I need to fight like him. Why are you dead cast for my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Again, praise him. My salvation, my God. Oh, can you relate to my story? Okay. Do you ever feel worn out, stuck, or discouraged? Well, grief and lament are good, but we must move beyond grief to hope and trust. Why are you cast down, oh my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation in my God. So, each of my wilderness solos helps me refocus on what's important, just like it did for me personally. I believe that I also need to do things for me, ministerially speaking. So, I'm going to encourage us right now, let's take time to refocus. Why do we do what we do? There are many studies over the years that show the value of Christian camping. Uh, the American Camping Association 20, 2005 produced something that Christ, the Canadian Camping Association, the C, 3CA, so not the 3CA, the 2CA, uh, and 20, 2011 did a, another study, and they both showed that significant growth happens at camps. Now, these aren't Christian organizations. Two um, papers, Hemorrhaging Faith and Renegotiating Faith in 2012 and 2018, showed by empirical research that those who experienced camp and had enhanced spiritual development. And much other work has been done, including our friends at the 3CA, and their materials on the power of camp. I love the whole campaign, and I still, still think it, it has lasting value right now as we remind ourselves of the power of camp and the need for it. We know that significant spiritual decisions often happen at camp, and that's probably what drew you to camp in the first place. I know, other than being almost born there, it's the reason why I continue to stay there. So I'd like to share with you my top 10 reasons of why I'm in camp. So, they aren't new, but they're worded in, in my way, that, and hopefully they'll empower you to go, yes, and you can say amen in, in, in your hearts as I say them. The first one is total immersion. Christian camping removes people from their normal experience 
in their normal environment and immerses them in one for an extended period of time, 24-7. This creates a platform for personal change to occur. Outdoor, number two, outdoor environment. Christian camping brings people into the outdoors and helps them learn to live in harmony with creation while pointing them to the Creator. Amen. Bye. Number three, oops, there we go. Number three, new experiences. Christian camping exposes people to new adventures and introduces them to skills and interests that they had often pursue later in life. Four, community focus. Christian camping helps people learn to live and work together with others. Lifelong friends are often the result. Five, healthy relationships. Christian camping helps develop biblical self-esteem and healthy independence. Six, hands-on learning. Most Christian camping programs are intentionally developed to help people grow in all areas of life, physical, social, mental, and spiritual. Seven, active lifestyles. Christian camping promotes healthy lifestyles, which stand in contrast to culture, especially our culture now, that is dominated by sedentary use of electronics. Number eight, hands-on leadership training. Few settings, we know it so well. There is effective at training leaders as Christian camping. And number nine, and these are in no particular order, Christian camping introduces people to a living relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And finally, Christian camping um, is, a, is fun. It's personal enjoyment and can create lasting memories. I'm sure you could have your own list. Um, I'd like to just point out that Dan Bolin, uh, who many of us know, um, is in the middle of writing a book. Actually, it's almost finished. He had it finished. And he's just redoing it now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be called Blueprints, available on November 9th from Refueling and Life Ministries. I just want to say one thing about it, because uh, he talks about it in the book, the five pillars of camp, and uh, the change of location, extended time outdoors, the immersion and creation, the relational bonding and spiritual intent. And I, I just, I want to encourage you to get the book. By the way, the book is going to be offered uh, at refuelingandfight.com, but I don't get any proceeds. It all goes to CCI. This is for the development of CCI around the world. So I'm quite excited for that at this time in his life. Um, so here's a quote from the book that maybe whet your appetite. Christian camping finds this biblical bedrock in Psalm 19. Uh, a foundational passage provides the strength and stability upon which the whole movement is built. Uh, quick overview. i, I got to at least do the quick overview. Uh, God reveals himself through creation. Like, I love, you know, you stand out there and you look at creation and you point it to people. The heavens declare the glory of God. The, the, that, that whole section starts. And then, then we, we, we see that in verse 7, moves to talking about scripture. And it talks about that God reveals himself through scripture. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And then we have our response. Verse 12 to 14. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Again, these are, it's a foundational passage for Christian camping. And we need to remind ourselves of it often. You know these truths. You know them well. But you need to remind yourself. Christian camping needs this, it's needed more now than ever. It's needed in our communities, in our committees, in our sections, in our country, and in our world. One last thought about the future of camping leaders that I'd like to leave you with as we uh, end our time. So another blog by Kerry Newell, I actually, I listen to Kerry Newell every week and I really appreciate it. There's tons of leadership lessons. Lots of times it's, it's gauged right out to um, uh, <coughs> times also uh, uh, we also have uh, applications to camping. So interesting, the, he talks about in this blog the five kinds of church leaders which gives us uh, uh, sort of a format to look at the five kinds of Christian camping leaders moving forward. And first of all, the deniers saying, it's not happening. There are still deniers out there right now. Uh, there's the reverters. Soon we'll get back to that way. I hate to say it, folks. We're not getting back. It's not going to be the same after COVID. Third is resigners. 
There's not much I can do. I just have to give in. Fourth, there's the adapters. And most of us have had to at least do adapting. And we're adapting to the situation. And fifth, there's the innovators that reinventing and, and uh, are trying to thrive in the future. Uh, and I think Christian Kevin will be different on the other side. And if it's not, we're probably not responding in an innovative and creative way. So what kind of Christian camping leader are you going to be in the future? Denier, reverter, resigner, adopter, innovator? Well, I pray that we would continue to be adopt and innovate. So in summary, I would say let's take time to grieve our losses. Don't, don't forget about that. And just writing in the chat probably wasn't enough. If you haven't done that, I think you, I would encourage you to do so. Secondly, is let's recommit to fighting our enemies. Those negative thoughts, the world system, and, and Satan, who often comes in and, and tries to disrupt us. Third, let's remember why we are in Christian camping. Let's remind ourselves of the value of Christian camping. Fourth, let's continue to adapt and innovate. Let's be the kind of leaders that will move Christian camping to the next level even after the pandemic. And four, in, in summary, let's move from discouragement to hope. Let me just pause and pray. So, Father, I just thank you for the time we've had for just a few minutes to look at the way things are, the experiences that we've been experiencing, reminding ourselves of the importance of grief and the importance and value of Christian camp. And may those truths penetrate deep and give us new encouragement that we too, like the psalmist, might hope in God. And we shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. In Jesus' name, amen.